Good. Okay, so good morning everyone and welcome to the real seminar for this morning. Uh, my name is Karen Joyce and I'm one of the lecturers in spatial sciences within the School of Environment. Um, so I want to say thank you to Ian for bringing your 101 class and welcome. Um, and to anyone that's come from outside of the university, welcome also. And so it's nice to see a good show this morning too. Um, so today I'm going to talk about a few different applications of remote sensing. Um, and the, the background that I come from is that I consider myself a fairly lazy person. Yeah? Who here thinks that they're lazy? Yeah? Pretty much everyone. And if you don't think you're lazy, answer this question for me. Would you prefer to work for 40 hours in your office or work for 20 hours and spend 20 hours on the couch or a beach or something? Yeah? So if you didn't say you were lazy first up, who's lazy now? Yeah? Okay. So what I'd like to do with remote sensing is to tap into that laziness and basically do things that will allow me to be lazy. So that either means to be able to work more efficiently or to get someone or something else to do the work for me. And that doesn't mean that I just get grad students to come and do my dirty work. Okay, so this is how I'm going to structure the talk today. So first of all, I'd like to talk a little bit about the remote sensing group, which is based at Charles Darwin University, as you guys know, up in the tropical north. I'd like to go through a bit about the education that I work with, with the classes that I teach, and also on the research side of things as well. Okay, so we're based within the Research Institute for the Environment and Livelihoods. And what I really work on is how to incorporate remote sensing into a number of different applications. So I work with natural hazards and fire, for example. And then we also work quite a bit in coastal environments. And our work on mangroves is done by, primarily by one of my grad students at the moment, Mudita Henkenda. I also work looking at weeds and how we can use remote sensing to map and monitor them, primarily through James Boyden, a PhD student working in Kakadu. We do quite a bit of work on savannah ecology and also how that relates to fire and natural hazards as well. And one of my main interests is looking at marine and benthic habitat mapping. So this comes from my background at the University of Queensland. So I'll talk a bit about that this morning as well. And finally, within our group, we have uh, David, who many people might have uh, heard speak two weeks ago when he talked about ocean colour or um, water quality monitoring using remote sensing. So that's our group and that's how I'll look at talking about some various research applications. But to get research going well, we need to make sure that we have the education working. So this is through both undergraduate and postgraduate coursework and research projects too. So let's have a look at what we offer at CDU in terms of undergraduate and also postgraduate coursework. So EMV 101, which is our introduction to spatial information that's being taught by Dr Ian Leeper at the moment and the 101 class is here with us today. I teach EMV 202 or 502 for postgraduate students, which is the introductory remote sensing class. And some of those guys are here today also. Now, Ian also teaches 208508, which is the applied GIS or introduction to GIS class. And then in, later in the year, I teach um, an intensive class on environmental monitoring and modelling, which is really advanced image processing. And to be taught in semester two for the first time this year is also EMV 308, which is advanced spatial analysis and really getting into a lot of applications and advanced, advanced working so of ArcGIS and other spatial information packages. So I facilitate my learning through a lot of online freely available tools. And the reason that I bring this to your attention is that if you're in a workplace and you do want some more information about remote sensing or if you're a student that's interested as well, you can have a look at a number of these different tools that are available. Um, so the first one which was released just this week is remotesensinglab.com. And this is a tool that's really basic. It looks like an app. So it's got that look and feel of being able to go into different modules and swipe on your iPad or iPhone or whatever. And so there's a number of different modules in there that you can work through. And this is really developing foundational understanding of remote sensing. Oh, I don't know how to get just one on. No. Nope. 
Sorry, I don't, I'm not too sure how to turn off all the lights. But anyway, so what you're watching now is a video on a remote sensing computer-aided learning package. And again, this is a freely available tool. And so if you're working in industry or government and, you do, and you've got new staff, for example, who you think need to get a bit, of a, a bit of a grounding in remote sensing, this is a really great tool to be able to log into and just work through some of the modules that are there. So there's a, a range of interactive animations, some questions you can, you can work through to answer, um, and a number of, of different fields that this goes through. So this is kind of like your online textbook. And again, that's a freely available tool for you to use. And the final area of educational tools that I use is my YouTube channel. Okay, and so this once again is, is a really large repository of not only remote sensing tools, but a lot of GIS information there as well. So if you're using ArcGIS, for example, in your workplace, and you can't remember how to get a legend on your map, for example, you can have a look and find out how to do that on my YouTube channel. Okay, so if you, if you can't remember the, um, the YouTube address there, it's, you can simply search for Karen Joyce and remote sensing, and you'll hit on me there. Okay, so from the education side of things, I'd really like to talk a little bit more about what we do in terms of research, both myself, but a little bit more broadly as well within the remote sensing group. Okay, so I introduced you guys before to the various topics um, and areas that we're interested in, um, but what I'd like to focus on today, uh, I guess, are the, are the areas that are a little bit closer to my heart rather than necessarily the work that is done by grad students or postdocs in our group. Um, so I will talk a bit about disaster management and our fire-based studies, a little on some, some savannah ecology and some benthic habitat mapping, that sort of thing. So first of all, I'd like to just have a bit of a touch on the disaster <coughs> management cycle. So remote sensing can be used for disaster management in a number of different ways. And the way I approach it is to have a look at the, at the cycle in a holistic manner. So Frequently what happens is that remote sensing gets used in the response phase. So something happens, there's a landslide or an earthquake, tsunami, whatever you like, and the first thing that you'll see up on the news is some, some footage, either in situ footage, so videos, photos, anything like that, or some satellite or airborne data. But this is really just the sexy part of the disaster management cycle, and it's not about disaster management. It's really just about that small phase of dealing with the response, what's happening here and now. So when we look at disaster management, it is a full cycle. And this is where remote sensing can be really powerful. Because to some extent, at that response phase, it's not necessarily that useful. It can be informative in terms of looking at pretty pictures. But what we really want to be able to do is to be able to build re resilience within communities. And we do this through the reduction and readiness phases of the disaster management cycle. So once we've gone through those phases, and that's, that's really all about building up awareness about what's going on in an environment, and also creating models that can help us develop risk assessment of certain locations for particular hazards or disasters as they might occur. So then we have the response, which is really getting on ground and dealing with what's occurring at that particular time and then moving into the recovery phase. And the recovery phase can go for years and years. And so this is where remote sensing is also really powerful in looking at a time series analysis of change over time there. So my work in looking at the disaster management cycle as a, as a whole is really all about trying to figure out how we can best utilise remote sensing to inform the disaster management cycle. And so how that will allow us to better prepare for any hazards or disasters that might come along and what we're going to do to react. So I work with a group of people who have been involved in, uh, in a few large projects to really start to build a framework to incorporate remote sensing. And so that's all about understanding exactly what type of data we need to acquire for any particular hazard under any particular scenario, then how we process it to best effect. And finally, how we deliver that information to managers to be able to work with that information. Okay, so it's really all about 
trying to bring remote sensing in in all phases where it can be really powerful and inform the cycle rather than purely responding to an event. So that's quite a broad scale touch on some of the research that I'm interested in that area. I'd like to look at a bit more on ground uh, application that isn't necessarily disaster management but what, what we can do with this particular application is look at how we build in remote sensing into recovery. Okay, So when we look at time series analysis it allows us to understand how ecosystems and environments and livelihoods are recovering over a period of time. So up on the screen at the moment you can see a satellite image and it's got two experimental plots in that image which is in Kidman Springs down south. Okay, So there's not a lot that's in Kidman Springs, um, but the Department of Primary Industries has had an experiment down there for the past 20 years or so to look at changes in woody vegetation with respect to grazing and fire regimes over, over a period of time. So when you look at this image, you might be able to see on the right hand side that there's a bit of a grid set up. And if we actually zoom into that particular area, you'll see that it's a grid that's been set up to have 16 individual plots. Okay, so in this image, for example, you see vegetation as red. Okay, so I don't need to go into the reason why that's the case, but just trust me when I say that the woody vegetation there is coming up as that red colour and the bare ground background is, is that sort of greeny blue cyan colour. Okay, so there's two of these plots that have been drawn up, if you like, in the landscape down in Kidman Springs. And each of the individual 16 plots have different grazing and, fi grazing and fire regimes. And what the Depart Department of Primary Industries has been doing is on a roughly yearly basis is they fly over that site and take photos of those individual plots from a helicopter hanging out the site. Okay? Two problems with this. Any ideas? Yeah. Flying on, on helicopter is very expensive, so the cost might be the first problem. Yep. Cost of helicopter um, flight? Expensive. Yeah. No, they can't get the exact position. Yep. Yeah, they can't get the exact same position every year. Okay, so we've got a few more ideas. Yeah. The fellow that has to hang out of the helicopter? Yeah, health and safety. safety. Yep. And they don't like doing that either. Yep. Anything else? Yeah, maybe not often enough. Depends. Yearly might be enough to see changes in the environment. Well, um, I guess it's like at a distance. Yep. Like if you're down on the ground, so on coast, you see a lot of things. Yep. Yeah, but that's part of what we want to do. We want to be able to step back to be able to see everything rather than just individual leaves on a tree. But what about, so if I have a look at that image itself, if I want to create a map and analyse the area of woody vegetation cover, do you see any problems with that photo? Yeah, it's not directly overhead, okay, so we've got this oblique photo which actually makes it difficult to analyse the area that's covered because we have distortions in that image. So the first stage of what we want to do is actually to rectify that image which gives us first of all coordinate information but then actually straightens it up. Um, and Miguel's been involved in doing a lot of this work to chop up these plots and um, rectify those for me. But so. Eventually what the idea for this project is that they, they want to get away from these helicopter surveys and they want to understand if we can use satellite remote sensing to do the same sort of thing that, that they've been doing rather dangerously with their helicopter overflights. Um, so at this stage they've got um, 16 individual plots within that grid. There's two different sites and over a series of 12 years. Okay, so 384 photos. Okay, here comes my first phase of laziness. I don't want to analyse 384 photos. Who wants to do that? Yeah. So my idea is that I want, to do, I want to use this imagery, the helicopter imagery, and see what I can do to be able to extract that information as quickly and, and as efficiently as possible. Okay, so I set up a classification rule set in a particular piece of software that we use that allows me to extract those areas of woody vegetation. Okay, so it's based a little bit on colour of the photo because as you can tell the vegetation in the photo has, has this greenish and sometimes in, it, in some cases a little bit of a blue tinge. Um, but your eyes also use other cues as well. Um, so we can get information about the fact that the woody vegetation has a shadow on the ground. 
um, we can have a look at the contrast between features around it and also the shapes of these individual features. So I can bring in all those different interpretation cues to write a model that will classify that for me automatically. So that's one plot, one out of my 384. And to extract all that information, it takes about 30 seconds. And the best thing about this is that I don't even have to sit at my computer to do this. Okay, so one of the powerful things about remote sensing is once, that you, once you set up those classification rules, you can press play and then go home for the afternoon. Come back in the morning, done. All right, so I take that square and then what I need to do is to figure out what the percentage is of woody vegetation in that particular plot. Um, which is quite simple, it's just a ratio of woody vegetation versus anything else. Okay, so I've just squared it up for, for presentation purposes, uh, but then I give a, give a, give a colour and an and a actual percentage value to that particular square. And so then if I take this and do this for all of my plots, on the left hand side you can see my two different sites. Okay, so one of the sites is called Conkerberry up the top and the other one's Rosewood down the bottom there. Okay, so each of those plots have a colour assigned based on the percentage vegetation that's there. So just quickly, that reddish colour is relatively low woody vegetation, and as you progress up to, up to the green values, or the green colours, that represents areas where there's more woody vegetation. Okay, so we've trialled this on two dates to start with, so from 1995 and straight away to 2013. And then what we can do is subtract those values from one date to the other. Okay, so the percentage woody vegetation in 2013 minus that in, in 1995. Which is the third one that you come across here, so the colour of change. All right, so in some areas you'll see the reddish colour, which in terms of change actually means that the woody vegetation has decreased in those areas. And that can be due to the fire regime or grazing effects. And in other areas you see that the, that the vegetation has increased, so those yellowy orange colours there as well. Okay, so a really quick way that we can use remote sensing to get this information out. And so the next step is to incorporate those 12 years of helicopter aerial photos and then also to compare them to the satellite data that we have over parts of that period of time to see if we can cut out the helicopter surveys and purely replace it with the satellite remote sensing. Okay, so moving on from there, and linked in quite closely to the fire and grazing story here is what we'd like to do in Lynchfield National Park to start to look at some vegetation dynamics. So what we've got is we, we have a site in Lynchfield National Park where we set up a number of different experiments. And this particular one just looks at, we've got two cameras on the right hand side there. So one's looking just horizontally outwards at the understory and the camera that you see on the right hand side is tilted at an angle which is known to be a magic angle to look at the vegetation density um, in terms of leaf and foliage cover. So we've got these cameras set up and I'm only going to talk about the analysis of photos taken from that right hand side camera. Um, but what this does is it takes a photo every half hour from around about 6 o'clock in the morning. So I get one at 6, 6.30 all the way through until 7 o'clock at night. So the early morning ones and the, and the evening ones aren't so great, so I cut those out first. But then, that means that I end up with 23 photos a day, 365 days a year, and nearly 8,500 photos. And what I want to get out of each and, e each and every photo is the vegetation percentage. Who wants to analyse those photos? There is no way you want to go through and essentially count leaves on those photos. So again, I use a similar process to what I spoke about with the Kidman Springs fire trial as well. And I can bring in all of those photos and develop a classification scheme to allow the computer to do this for me automatically. So every month we go out and we take the SD card out of the, out of the camera, or at least Stefan does, and brings it back for me to analyse. When I'm about to go home for the day, I put it, I put it into my computer and essentially press run. And then by the time I get back in the next morning, all the photos for the month have been analysed for me. And what I get out of those photos, on the right hand side, you can see a photo that comes in to start with. All right, So you can see the, the, the branches, the leaves, a little bit of cloud in the sky. And then when I look at actually classifying that, I extract just the vegetation component of that. 
Okay, so this uses a combination of not only colour, but also the shape of different features. Okay, and it uses that same classification scheme all the way through all my photos and runs through those quickly. And again, it takes about 30 seconds or so per photo. So that one that you see second down is where I've got the green and the blue is the binary classification or vegetation, no vegetation. And down the bottom right hand side is Stefan and another colleague of ours looking at a leaf trap. Okay, so this is what we use to actually calibrate the information that we get. Okay, so we can essentially count or weigh those leaves that come down. Does segmentation uh, shadows uh, affect your segmentation? The shadows can affect the segmentation when I, when I create this rule set, but I can also deal with them by factoring those out by using combinations of, of colours. Um, yeah, I don't need to use time duration, no. No. So basically for those who are familiar with remote sensing at all, you can use two bands of light, say red and blue together, um, and when you ratio the two of them, then you, you're looking at, um, at more of a, a relative brightness as opposed to absolute, so you can cut out shadows in that way. I can talk to you more about but that later. It's just a regular colour camera, but you can still split it up into a red, green and blue component. So when you get all of that data out, so if every single photo I have a percentage value of what it sees as vegetation versus background, and that's actually called the contact frequency when it's acquired from the camera at this particular magic angle. So if you have a look at the graph up here with on the x-axis I've got the date. So we started this experiment back in April 2012. And on the y-axis, this contact frequency, which is essentially that percentage value that you see that's extracted the vegetation there. Now, there is a gap around December 2012 when, unfortunately, we had a flooded camera issue. So we lost about six weeks' worth of data because, of course, it coincided with people being away over holidays so we didn't go out and collect the, the data there. So that's a little gap that you see. But what you can also see in this graph is the huge volume of data points there. And so when we, can, when we run this through statistics, that'll actually pull out a trend for us. And I do know that there's some issues with this. So here's, a, here's our wet season peak, um, our first one for 2012 and our second one for 2013. There is a bit of a drop off that's happening a little bit too quickly uh, or sort of towards the shoulder of the wet season. Um, and that's a problem with the algorithm that I'm using for classification. So I do know that and I need to go in and make some amendments there. But one of the really cool things about this particular graph, aside from actually being able to track exactly that timing of leaf fall, is this particular bump just there. Okay, so you see rapid drop off just at that point. Anyone know what that might be? Bingo. Okay, so in July last year, we had a fire that came all the way through our Litchfield National Park site. And you see on the top left, 10 a.m. on the morning of the 5th of July. And then the last photo that night at 7.30 and the fire just coming in over the horizon. The first photo that was usable, first thing the next morning, prior to that it was still smoky. But you can see how much it's actually burnt through the site. Um, and then a couple of weeks later you can see all the leaf litter starting to build up on the floor. Okay. So when, that, when that's on the ground, that means obviously that it's not up in the trees. Okay, so that's why we see that sudden drop in the vegetation cover, because it's all on the ground. Okay, so moving on from savannas and fire, I'd like to talk a bit more about my work in marine or benthic habitat environments. And to, to go through this, I need to explain a little bit about one of the main reefs that I've done quite a bit of work on. So this is Heron Reef in the Southern Great Barrier Reef. And if you're familiar with the Queensland coast at all and you know where Gladstone is, this is just off the coast of there. And the University of Queensland has a really nice research station on Heron Reef. Um, and it's the primary reason I do what I do because I wanted to go to this place. It's pretty magic. So if you do ever get the opportunity to go to Heron or any of the, um, the beautiful research stations that Australia has on any of those reefs, I'll highly recommend it. But to orient you guys 
to this image a little bit. So first of all, this is a, is a mosaic of airborne imagery. Okay, so this one isn't satellite this time. So this was taken by a sensor called CASI, which is the Compact Airborne Spectrographic Imager. So it's a hyperspectral sensor, which means that it acquires, acquires imagery in a lot of different wavelengths of light. Okay, the, so the camera or the, the aircraft and camera flies backwards and forwards over the reef. We get the data and put it all together to make our complete image. So the reef itself from east to west is about 11 kilometres and the north-south extent about 4 k's. Okay, so it's a relatively large area and the only land is this black bit. Okay, so the eye of the dead rat if you like. Okay, so that's, that's the island. And the island is 800 metres east to west and 400 metres north-south. Okay, so really, really small in the, context, in the context of the entire reef. Okay, so to further break, break that down, half of the island, so the western half of the island, is made up of the research station and a really snobby resort. It's lovely, but the research station is a lot nicer to go to. The eastern half of the island is just National Park, okay, so this is just all nice forested vegetation and a lot of, a lot of birds that will um, crap on you as you walk through. It's an awesome place. Anyway, so that gives you a bit of a context for the scale of things that we're looking at here on the reef, so you can understand a little bit more about it as I talk through it. Now, to also get a bit more information about what you're actually looking at, because something like this might be a little bit foreign to you in terms of those features, what I'd like to do is to take this strip out through here and I've switched it on its side, okay? So I'm just taking that bit out for the purpose of looking into it into a little bit more detail, okay? So again, we've got that up the top, north on the right hand side this time and south down the, um, down the left. Okay, so if we look at that cross section of the reef, we've got a number of different features that primarily occur in different zones of that reef. Okay, so off the reef crest, so this is this area here and off to the right hand side, this is where our deeper water is and that's mainly where we have our nice big live coral. Okay, so that can be a combination of the branching type corals or the massive corals like what, what I've shown on the other side. There is a slight difference um, from the north side compared to the south side in, the, in that the north side is a little bit more sheltered whereas the south side gets a lot more weather. So the, the south side would tend to have a lot more bra branching corals where we get some more branch, um, massive and, and um, plate corals on the north side. So that's our deep water and so that's the area where you want to go diving. Okay, so maximum uh, sort of 10 to 15 metres just off the crest here for Heron Island. Um, and so some reefs it's a, a lot deeper obviously. Then as we come up to, up to the crest of the reef, we start to get into areas of rock and rubble. Okay, so this is where a lot of the breaking waves come and smash down the coral, break it up, and, and then it gets, it gets cemented into a, into a relatively hard surface. And so this protects the rest of the inner parts of the reef from a lot of the incoming weather. Okay, so we, we know basically that's what, that's what those particular zones are made of. So when we start to look at remote sensing, we know already that we're looking for live coral off this area and some rocks and rubble, the, the rubble being the broken up bits from the waves up the top there. Now as we move inside of those reef crests, we've got a lagoon environment. So the depth of the lagoon at Heron is up to around about five to eight metres, depending on what the tide's like of the day. Um, and what you see happen here is you'll see some cyanobacterial mats. So that's represented just by that there. And you can also see in the image up the top that sort of greeny brown colour. Um, so it's just like a, a layer on the sand of cyanobacteria or fine algae. Um, we've got other areas where we get these coral bommies Okay, so in the middle of the lagoon, we get some coral built up with some rock and algae and a mixture of other bits and pieces in there as well. And then the process sort of repeats on the other side too. Okay, so just as an indication, we've got some nice coral areas, some rock rubble, some really clear sandy areas um, and some algae on the right hand side there. So when we're looking at remote sensing, 
and we want to map any of these individual features, the first thing that we want to do is to take out a field spectrometer to measure the light that's reflected off those individual features. Okay? So this is just a little tool that we can point to anything and it just records that amount of light incoming into the sensor. And that's essentially what a satellite does for us also. Okay, but this time we know exactly what we're pointing at. So we can, we can say, okay, right, well that's the light reflected from a coral, for example. And now how, how can I find that in a satellite image? So up here I've just given an example of what we call a spectral signature plot. Okay, so basically on the x-axis you see wavelength of light and on the y-axis the amount of reflected light at any particular wavelength. Okay, so we can only see in the visible region of light, which is mostly what I've got plotted here. Okay, we can actually measure much longer wavelengths of light, but they actually don't get through the water, so they're not so useful for coral reef monitoring. So I've plotted pretty much the visible region, and then what I've also got is each of the signatures of the different features that I'm interested in. Um, and I say signatures in inverted commas because a signature is usually something that's supposed to be unique to a feature or to yourself if it's your own signature that you're writing. Okay? But the problem with when we're looking at natural features is that there's so much variability that the term signature is a little bit of a misnomer. Okay? So, so I could have a look if I'm doing some terrestrial work, have a look and get the signature of a tree or a leaf on that tree, and the leaf right next to it is going to be a little bit different. Okay? But in any case, this is what we call it, a spectral signature. So by this plot, I'm saying that this is what sediment looks like in that yellow line. This green line, for, the, for example, on the bottom is, is an algae. Um, and then I've got some rock, rubble, um, and a couple of different corals in there as well. Okay, so first stage, we go out, we measure the light, then we look at this and say, okay, can I tell the difference between each of these graphs or each of the lines on my graph? Okay? So have a think. Can you tell the difference between the lines on that graph? Yeah? Yeah? Who thinks they can? Yes? No? Okay. All right, so that's stage one. Can you tell the difference? If you can't tell the difference at this point, that's it, no point going further. But you can here, so let's go to the next stage. Okay, photos taken off the side of the boat just under the surface of the water. Can you see the coral? Can you tell the difference between the coral and other things there? Yeah? yeah? Sweet. What about now? So this is an airborne image data clip hyperspectral image. Can you tell me which is coral, which is algae, which is sand? You can see sand, right? Yeah. yeah? But maybe not so much. Okay, really expensive data set to fly. Like 80 grand type stuff. Can you tell the difference now? Okay, so what you see now is you can start to bring in individual pixels. Yeah? So you can see those pixels, and each of those pixels is made up of lots of different features. Okay, so this is one of the satellites, um, or one of the images from a satellite that often gets used on Google Earth. Okay, this is a four metre pixel size here. What about now? Can we see the coral? Okay, freely available satellite data, Landsat. We use it all the time for a variety of purposes. Okay, so we might be able to see where the reef is and perhaps general zones, but I can't actually say, yeah, that's 50% coral or whatever. Okay, so we've got a fairly significant problem here. But so what I'd like to suggest is that within a pixel, I can't necessarily say, well, that pixel is definitely coral. Okay, because within a set area, even if it's as small as one by one metre, it's not just coral. There's so much heterogeneity in that environment that there's no way that I can say that that pixel is definitely coral. I can say, yes, that's sand, because sand does occur at those scales, but coral often doesn't. So what I've done a lot of work on is to try and see, well, if I can't tell that that pixel is coral, is it possible to use some of those spectral signature 
information bits to decide, well, is 50% of it coral? Is there something in that signature that's going to let me figure out what percentage of coral is? I don't care what else is with it. I don't care if it's some algae, some rocks, some sand. I don't care about any of that. I just want to know the coral. Because at the end of the day, we're interested in understanding the health, health of reefs, which to a large extent is based around how much live coral we have. So within this, and again, this is the hyperspectral image that I showed at the beginning, so we've got a lot of different wavelengths to, to work with. What you can see is the full image at the top, and it's actually each pixel has then been broken up into a percentage worth of coral. This is a zoomed in portion of the lagoon area that you can see in the red square up the top here. And now I just want to look at the Mickey Mouse ears here. Okay, so this is one of these coral bombies that I was talking about before. So there's, there's some sand type stuff in the middle, that's the bright feature that you see. Um, and then the coral is occurring around the outside with a mixture of rock and some algae as well. So when we apply the algorithm that I've used to this image, we start to come up with this uh, quite salt and pepper look, okay, which is giving me an indication of just how variable in each of those individual pixels are. Okay, so we're estimating within the pixel what the percentage of coral is, and each pixel can be different to the one right next to it. Okay, so this works at a completely different scale to some of the stuff that we do when we're working on land. So to take some of our work a step further, we've been involved in quite a bit of capacity building, um, and these photos were taken by um, Ian Leeper from some of his work in, in Timor-Leste. So we've done some training both on using remote sensing and also on habitat mapping for coastal and marine environments in, in West Timor and in Timor-Leste. So the idea here is that while we develop the, the tools and techniques here at CDU to map these environments, then what we actually do is rather than map certain areas of Timor-Leste, we actually transfer those skills to those guys. Okay, so we've ta taken projects over there where they've, got, they've had training in the image processing, so they know how to create the, create the maps that we're working with, but they also know how to do some field validation as well. So just to bring it back to the areas of interest of, of the remote sensing group and like I said, myself in general, I've, I have talked a little bit about the disaster management cycle and looking at fire and, and recovery in environments with respect to, with respect to grazing and woody vegetation. Um, I looked at some savannah ecosystems and how we're, how we're using remote sensing to really quickly extract information of large volumes of data but do that um, in, a, in a timely and an accurate manner. And then also looked at some of the work that I've been doing on benthic and marine habitat mapping. The last stage that I wanted to look at is, is our ongoing work with unmanned airborne systems. Okay, so commonly gets referred to, commonly get referred to as drones. Um, though we tend to shy a little bit away from the term drone due to its negative connotations with dropping bombs. Um, which of course is not where my interest is. Um, and so I bring in the term unmanned airborne system and the key there is the word system. Okay, so I'm not just talking about a platform that flies, an aircraft or a rotary vehicle, um, but it also incorporates the communications, the processing software and hardware that we need to use, the users and also the crew on the ground. So we say something is unmanned, that actually means that there's no one that's sitting physically on the platform to fly it, so we don't have the pilot in that vehicle, but we actually have pilots on the ground. Um, we need control stations and also a payload, which is looking at the, the sensors, so the cameras, but also the navigation systems there as well. Um, so two of the little birds that, that we're using in the group, um, this is a Harvey Norman Special, um, just one of the ones that we're looking at pretty much learning to fly with this one. Um, we can also strap a super lightweight camera on the bottom of it. It actually has comes with two cameras. Um, so it's got this forward looking camera at the front and then also has another camera at the bottom. But we don't like the quality of the, the images that have been coming out of those. So this is um, it, 
weighs the same as a GoPro, but it's got a no nicer profile for being aerodynamic to strap on the bottom of this system. So this one is controlled by, by your iPad um, and also has a GPS attached to it so you can upload a flight plan and send it wherever you like. Um, we've also made some modifications. So this has got what's called an indoor hull on it. So this, this styrofoam framing is called an indoor hull, which is interesting because it's actually illegal to fly them indoors. But anyway, it looks kind of funky. Um, so this is how we actually fly it when it's outside. Um, so a little bit smaller. Um, can take off, take off the top here to have a look at um, the battery and the GPS sits on the top as well. Um, and this one Stefan has modified so that the camera looks directly down also just with a nice little bit of Lego. Um, and this one is a near infrared camera as well so we can use this for vegetation. Yeah. Um, how far would they go? So this one when you're controlling it by your iPad, it's got a Wi-Fi signal to it and you have a 50 meter range. The problem with it is that you, when you have the GPS in it, you can actually upload your waypoints to the system um, and it will fly wherever you send it. So you don't have to be within that 50 meter range. So incredibly dangerous to do this. So it's yep, definitely not something that we encourage or, or use within our group at all. Um, but so we're using these guys um, just as, a, as to start with a learn to fly type experience, um, but also because we are, we are building into um, looking at some larger funding sources to get some more sophisticated systems as well. Uh, but this still works perfectly well for say flying out at Litchfield and taking some canopy pictures so we can now start to look up and look down as well. And this for us is really bridging the gap between using satellites or manned aircraft and being able to collect data on the ground. If we look at a manned aircraft, to get it up to Darwin has a $40,000 mobilisation cost. So it's, it's a really, really expensive option and that will take one flight for us. We could take that out this afternoon, so we've got that flexibility. And so that's where our interest comes in for using our manned airborne systems. Um, but it, it's not quite as, as simple as just, just picking it up and taking it out. There's, there's quite a lot of licensing that goes in behind that as well. Um, so we've been working on looking at defining what the, what the optimal um, or what the most used types of configurations are for these systems. Okay, so whether you want to look at using a fixed wing or a rotary system, um, there's some other options there of, um, of kites or blimps as well. So our manned airborne systems are not actually a new technology. It's in the media a lot lately and even this week there was one that flew into a Melbourne prison to drop some drugs. So you see a lot of it now in the media, and that's not what we use it for either. Um, but they have actually been around for a long time. And the, f the first indication of unmanned, um, unmanned flight was actually in 350 BC. So they've been around for a long time. It's just now the technology is catching up that we can, we can use them relatively easily. So in any case, when you look at the graph on the top right hand side, um, we've got weight along the x axis. Um, and the endurance up on the y-axis. So basically what you see is that the biggest systems have the ability to fly for longer. Okay, so, so this one says that it can fly for up to 30 minutes, but the second we put an additional camera on it really drops that time down. Okay, so although, although this little camera weighs um, 80 grams, that actually cuts the flight time in half. Okay, so basically we wait for technology to catch up to make the, make the cameras lighter which will then allow us to fly for longer um, and therefore cover more area. But so at this stage, if, if we want to say fly for a day which is at the top of the, the y-axis there, we want a really, really big system and that's something that, that gets you say with, um, with NASA um, or, or the military. Okay, so we're... At CDU, we're really down in the bottom left-hand corner, which is the home of the rotary systems. Okay, so we use rotary because they they can they can have a heavier lift than fixed wings, um, but they just won't fly quite as long. So that's a little black graph there. Um, and so this one's actually looking at how the weight <coughs> relates to um, to the payload that we can carry. Okay, because you can choose: do you want to fly for a long time, or do you want to attach a bigger camera? Um, and actually I want both, so I was trying to find where that trade-off is. Okay, so again, we're sitting in that, 
in that bottom left-hand corner in terms of only being able to carry a small payload um, and not flying very far. But it's still enough to do a decent survey of a field site into an area where you can't otherwise get your feet or boat into. Okay, so back in our group. And overall, so as I mentioned, I was going to talk about the education and the research side, um, which I've done and hopefully either sparked some interest for some more questions um, or given you something to, to take away um, to work with in the future. So, any questions? <coughs> Karen. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. And I wonder if that can be translated to some form of biodiversity. The bottom E. Uh, my Mickey Mouse? Yeah. Or either, well, any of those three, they're all the same, yeah. Yeah, does that say anything about the, um, the nature of those particular Yeah, it, um, actually, to be honest, I haven't looked too far into that, but it definitely could because you, you generally want um, high diversity in any area, um, which you're going to get quite a lot of in, in reef environments anyway. There has been some work done which looked at, at heterogeneity versus homogeneity, because um, what you tend to have occur is that if, if a reef undergoes some form of change, perhaps there's been an attack by crown of thorns or there's been big bleaching or something like that has occurred, it quickly gets overgrown by algae. And as soon as you get an overgrowth of an area by algae, you lose a lot of that variability and heterogeneity. Um, and that's something that, that is relatively easy to map compared to that. So yeah, it, it could be. What you, what you need to do really is to be able to do it in a time series as opposed to just a single snapshot, which that is. Yeah. And to get that classification in the Turkey or whatever, uh, do, you get, do you use one band, several bands? No, that's multi-bands, multi yeah. Yep, so that's using, using different ratios and, um, and derivatives, which is looking at the slope of, of the spectra. Yep. Yeah. How much does the burn actually weigh? This one itself? Well, I don't know offhand, but here you go. <laughs> so much. Less than a kilo. Yeah. Less than a kilo, you reckon? That's not a lot. At all. But like I said, these are relatively cheap ones as well. So commercial off the shelf, you're going up to about $60,000. Um, this, this one, like I said, Harvey Norman Special, $450. Um, plus a few extra souped up options on it to take it a bit higher than that. But yeah. Can you, what's the, um, with the drones, can you get good before and after photos positioning it in exactly the same place or using the GPS? Yeah, not with this. Um, yes, in, in theory, when you purchase one of the more higher end systems, um, the GPS on this is okay, but you know it's no better than the GPS in your mobile phone. Um, so you're looking at a plus or minus 10 meter or so. Um, and when your pixel size is down to a couple of centimeters, um, it's not that great. I mean, it depends on the change that you're looking at. If you've got if you've got a massive change um, and you're going to look at before and after photos, you'll be able to rectify them together, but not quite. It's, it's not such a simple um, thing without a, without a really good GPS. And this one also doesn't have on it um, what we call an inertial measurement unit, which measures the roll, pitch, and yaw of the platform when it's, when it's acquiring any data. Um, so if you've got any variations in that, which you will with that sort of platform, um, you don't need much of a breeze for it to, to kick off. But yes, possible, um, but challenging, yeah. Sorry, there was another, yeah. Um, so, so can I look? Can I look at applying the the same classification technique um, in a in a forested environment to what I was using in Cumin Springs? Yeah. Um, yes and no. 
Um, so I wouldn't use the exact same rule set. Okay, so that was that's primed for that that area and that those vegetation types. Um, Medita is actually doing her PhD on looking at using something extreme, very similar to that, but in mangrove environments, um, being uh, being able to extract individual tree crowns. Um, so what I've shown in Kidman Springs doesn't doesn't separate if I've got two trees next to each other. It just says it's woody vegetation, doesn't care that they're separate crowns or anything. Um, but Medita's taking it one step further and, and like I said, using it in a, in a much more complicated environment as well to be able to get exactly there. Yeah. Do you use both cameras to this No, so, the, so I'm using the, the magic angle, 57 degrees looking up at the canopy. Um, the horizontal camera is there to, to look at the undergrowth. Um, and next week, um, Cammy's actually doing her, her master's proposal defence and she'll be using that camera looking out, so she'll talk a little bit more about that, which I should then go to. Next week. <laughs> Anything else? Yes, yeah, Shema. Oh, so why do I have a camera that takes a photo every 30 minutes out at Litchfield? Um, the first reason was because when we got the cameras, we didn't know what we were going to do with it. So we thought, well, let's just take lots of photos. Um, so that was set up, and it wasn't until several months later that we thought, actually, let's use this. So the first stage that I did was to process all the data because I can um, and use it to identify the optimal time of day to acquire those photos. Okay? So that's the time when there's least variability around what that vegetation density is that it extracts out. Um, so, so in doing that, I, I can say that you could just use 10 o'clock. Okay? So 10 o'clock gives, really um, gives a really good image. And that's, that's not that surprising considering that's also the time that most satellites have their overpass. The reason being is because statistically it's the lowest cloud level at that time of day. So any earlier than that, sometimes we have condensation on the lens, sometimes there's a bit of fog, and then too much later, then, then we have some tree movement as well, which affects the data. So yes, if you're only going to take one photo a day, 10 o'clock, go for it. Um, however, having that, that volume of data, as you saw in the plot, meant that it just gave us so much data to be able to work with when we're putting that, the trend analysis through it. Um, so it just, it just actually adds, adds that additional layer of information for us. But yeah, not absolutely necessary. Cool. Does the information on Sorry? Does it add information on Does it? Add information on the noise. Oh, does it add information or more noise? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, we block out the really noisy times, so first thing in the morning and later in the evening. Um, but it, it, supports the, it supports the findings that we have at, at around 10 o'clock because sometimes there might be some excess cloud that the algorithm wasn't able to pull out at that time. So then you can rely on those other, the other times of the day. Yeah. Wondering if there's hyperspectral satellite platforms around there? Yeah, so um, Hyperion was, I, I think, the first hyperspectral platform um, or sensor that went up on the EO1 platform. Um, it uh, doesn't have a great coverage, so it's got a 30 meter pixel, which is the same, same size as Landsat. Um, a large amount of that data is also free through the um, United States Geological Survey. Um, so it can be used, but the coverage of it is not that great. And of course, it's never in the area that you want for it to be. So there, there are others planned, but with hyperspectral data, because they look at very narrow regions of the electromagnetic spectrum, they, they can't look in fine spatial detail. Um, so they're great if you want to um, cover broad scale areas. Um, so if I want to say, well, these are the broad geographic regions, or so broad geomorphic regions of a reef, um, but they, they can't get down to that fine spatial detail. Andrew. Thanks, Karen. Um, where are we at with the uh, CASA regulation of um, flight paths and so on, front-hand aerial vehicles? I imagine uh, 
this latest incident with dropping drugs into the prison might, um, might be catching the attention of the regulators for this sort of technology? Yeah, so um, the regulations for unmanned flight actually date back to 2002. Um, and the problem with that is that in the past 10 years, there's been a huge shift in technology. So what we can actually do with the systems now wasn't even conceived of 12 years ago. Um, so there's a real problem with the law catching up with, um, with technology. But so basically, the, we're governed by, by two particular acts. The first is the, um, the, essentially the Unmanned Act, and the second is the Model Aircraft one. So basically, what they, what they tell us is that you can fly under 400 feet, um, no closer than three nautical miles of, of an airfield, um, not within 30 metres of, um, of people, property um, or animals who are not involved in it. So if I'm flying the thing, I can be within 30 metres, but no one else can. Um, and so they're the, they're the key restrictions. So on top of that, to actually fly for anything other than a hobby, so if you guys want to go out and buy a system tomorrow and fly, at some, some paddock outside those, those restrictions, that's fine. But if you want to fly for commercial gain, um, then you actually need a licence. Um, and depends on what level, what, what sort of system you're flying as to what type of licensing you need. So it does go all the way up to you needing your personal, pi private, personal pilot's licence. So there's the dealing with unmanned airborne systems, the, buying the platform itself is actually the cheap part. It's all the, all the certification and licensing, training, hardware, software, maintenance, all that additional stuff that actually adds to the cost of the package. But still cheaper than, um, than bringing a manned aircraft up to Darwin. So. And academia falls under personal use? <laughs> it's grey. Yeah, it's very grey. I just had a meeting with CASA this week and they couldn't definitively tell me um, where we fall. So in theory we could going out and measure the beach erosion on Cantorina Beach or something like that on a regular basis without... Yeah, you have to be careful about the three nautical miles of the airfield. Oh, yeah.